Hey, welcome to Explore the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 6 through 19. Uh, before we get going, a little quick preview, uh, our review from last week, we saw Solomon, the wisest man in all the world, actually became foolishly wise, largely through the collection of a thousand wives and concubines, an overwhelming number on any level. In chapter 12, we'll see his son, Rehoboam, foolishly believes that he is greater than his father. In that, we will see a nation become divided. Solomon was told in chapter 11 that the kingdom was going to be torn into two, uh, excuse me, would, would be torn in two, and most of it would go to one of his servants. We are introduced to a very capable and industrious man named Jeroboam. The Hebrew words describe him as a mighty man of valor. Solomon put him in charge of the forced labor, labor coming from Ephraim and Manasseh, which together make up the house of Joseph. We're told Jeroboam grew, in, uh, grew resistant to Solomon because of certain building projects. Last week, we talked about a thousand women in Solomon's life. On average, that is a new one every two weeks. In addition, Solomon gathered immense treasures, horses, and so on. Ab Abraham Publications describes it this way, paraphrasing, 700 wives and 300 concubines needed royal housing and room for an incredible number of servants and provisions. Uh, they likely had countless children who increased this need. Solomon built many temples and altars to foreign gods as well. From Jeroboam's perspective, Solomon used his wisdom to write poetry and shower wealth on women, and he was responsible for getting all the necessary facilities built with forced labor. This was Egypt all over again, slave labor su uh, supporting a king who didn't care about the common man. The, the prophet Ahijah meets Jeroboam on a country road and tells him that, that the Lord God of Israel is going to make him king over 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. Solomon hears about this and he sets out to have Jeroboam killed. Jeroboam escapes to Egypt and is there until he hears that Solomon has died. The first five verses in chapter 12 tell us that Jeroboam uh, returns to, returned from Egypt and Rehoboam is in the process of being made king in Shechem. It's important because Jeroboam was formerly in charge of the forced labor from Ephraim and Manasseh. Shechem is in Manasseh on the border with Ephraim, about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. Rehoboam is being made king on Jeroboam's home turf, and Jeroboam becomes the spokesperson for the people who are not of Judah. Neither David nor Solomon would have dreamed of being made king outside of Jerusalem. Imagine if a new, if, if a new president of the United States decided to have a, a normal swearing-in ceremony done somewhere other than Washington, D.C. It's unthinkable. The fact is that this happens in Shechem uh, may tell us a little bit about, uh, excuse me, a little bit of the, quote, we versus they, end quote, sediment that had already been formed between the kingship of Jerusalem and those outside of it who have to support it. Both David and Solomon had opposition uh, to, to their becoming king, but none is, is recorded in Rehoboam becoming king of all Israel. It appears to be a smooth succession. There's, there's no ceremony or anointing. Uh, this is, there is no opposition to it initially. Jeroboam tells Rehoboam, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your, uh, of your father, this heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. First Kings chapter 12, verse 4. Rehoboam replies, go away for three days and then come to me again in verse, verse five. The other thing to note is the last part of chapter 11 is that God raises adversaries against Solomon who enjoyed, uh, who enjoyed peace throughout most of his reign as king. This is part of the judgment placed upon him by God for his unfaithfulness towards God. The two main people in this chapter are Re Rehoboam and the, and the son of Solomon, excuse me, the son of Solomon and Jeroboam. It's always been confusing to me which is which because their names are similar. They are, they, um, and they both end up as kings over different parts of is Israel once the kingdom becomes divided. I think of it this way. Jeroboam and Jerusalem, where Solomon and his son Rehoboam lived, where, where Solomon is and his son Rehoboam lived, both start with, with these letters. J-E-R. Now, this may sound confusing, 
but Jeroboam was from the north. He wasn't from Jerusalem. Jeroboam didn't like the orders he got from Jerusalem. Jeroboam got most of the kingdom, but not Jerusalem. Jeroboam set up worship in the northern territory so the people wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem for worship. Jeroboam is anti-Jerusalem. The contrast is clear. Rehoboam grew up in the comfort of the palace. Jeroboam worked in the construction business, managing, managing a group of forced labor for the palace. Rehoboam's name means the people are enlarged or enlarge the people. Rehoboam grew up in the palace, likely with the, sense, with the same sense his father had, that people were just tools to accomplish what the king wanted. Uh, we, we would do well to follow his name and literally enlarge the people. Jeroboam's name, who is anti-Jerusalem, means the people will contend. This is exactly what Rehoboam was going to get when he, when he is encountered by Jeroboam. Confrontation, not just from Jeroboam, but from all the people he represents. King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, uh, while he was yet alive. Chapter 12, verse 6. At this, point, at this point, Rehoboam was the king over all Israel. He likely had a, a working knowledge of his father's senior advisor. This could be read in two ways. One, one way was to look at it is that Rehoboam consulted with the trusted senior advisors because they had great wisdom from working with his father. The other way it could be looked at is that the reference to the old men is derogatory as in the old men who are no longer useful that I intend to replace. This group included priests, palace officials, military leaders, and administrative officials. Solomon's reign had featured much economic prosperity for the nation. So these elders represented a vast amount of successful experience. Continuing in uh, verse six, how do you advise me to answer this people? What does this phrase, this people, tell us about Rehoboam's view of the people. It doesn't sound very polite. He doesn't refer to them as God's people, which they are. It sounds dismissive, dismissive and he doesn't, have, he doesn't place a high value on them. Continuing in verse seven, if you, will, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them, when, when, when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. The senior advisors understood the harsh conditions that many had to endure. The Bible often speaks in threes. We see here uh, in, in that the word serve or servant is spoken three times. They come from the same root word, and, and it describes someone who submits his will to serve another. We know people in public leadership who are public servants. We also know those who appear to be in it for personal power or gain. The elders are encouraging servant leadership, which is, which is what Jesus modeled and encourages us to live by. Note the cycle. If you will serve them, they will serve you. They encourage Rehoboam to speak good words. Uh, we spoke previously about the Hebrew word for good includes the idea of fulfilling the purpose for which you were created, which is to honor God. They encourage him to literally speak life into the people. They aren't telling him to avoid hard conversations. They are advising how to have them. Rehoboam's elders had witnessed the toll that Solomon's success and building projects had taken on the people. Perhaps they also saw the strain that it caused on the general population spirit. Gary says here, I used to work in a place where there was a strong sentiment of managing the message. The elders weren't speaking of managing the message here but speaking from the heart with a sense of empathy and understanding. This is a hard, good concept for leaders to hear and those who want to be leaders. It's hard to manage the, the message without coming off like you're not telling everything. Uh, you're, excuse me. It's hard to manage the message without coming off like you're not telling everything that should be known. Fourthly, wise leaders know who to seek counsel from. And how, to, excuse me, and and know how and, and how to take it before making important decisions. A wise leader has to know how to evaluate and advise. They are getting uh, evaluate the advice that they are getting and determine how to proceed. 
here's a good model for leadership here. Be a servant, serve them, answer them, make sure that you communicate and you speak good words, encouraging words, improve conditions by showing grace. Continuing on to verse eight, he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. There's a contrast here more than just age. The old men compared, the, uh, compared to the young men. The word translated into the phrase young men is the Hebrew word most often translated as child. We see the contrast between elders who worked with, for the wisest man in the world and childish men. In addition to that, the elders served in the palace and the young men had grown up with Rehoboam in the palace. They grew up in luxury. These two groups of people, uh, excuse me, these are two groups of people who couldn't be more different. The word translated as abandoned may tell us that Rehoboam was searching for a specific response and he didn't get it. He already had formulated a response in his mind that seemed right to him and he was looking for confirmation for it. He sees the elders' advice as a sign of weakness, and he didn't take. He didn't. He doesn't see the the. Excuse me, and he doesn't see the threat to his position as king. Uh, it appears here that Rehoboam is looking for yes men. Uh, the word translated as abandoned also, and the same word translated as forsake in Deuteronomy thirty one six, where we're speaking of God, we're told He will not leave you nor forsake you. Uh, verse nine. What do you advise that we answer these people who have said to me, lighten the yoke that your father has put on us? It's a different question than he had asked the elders. He asked the elders, how do you advise me? This is personal to him. He asked the young men, how should we answer? The, the word we is plural. This is not the language of a leader who understands that there is only one king who takes responsibility and communicates effectively. <clears throat> The request to lighten the load is repeated three times for emphasis in chapter 12. The economic growth in Solomon's reign uh, had, come to a, had come with a price. Solomon's many building projects had put a strain on the people, many of whom comprised part of Solomon's workforce, 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. A large administration uh, meant each district needed to provide more during uh, the, the one month per year that the district was responsible for, according to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 7. Verse 10 reveals to us the response of the young men. It says this, the young men who had grown up with him said to him, thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. Note the tone of the statement. The young advisors have no perspective. They have no compassion for the people. They have no real concern for Rehoboam or his situation. They are in a position of power and authority, and, but have no experience and little regard for, the, for their fellow people. Their advice is to tell the people that he is far greater than his father, even though he hasn't done anything. And everyone knows this can't possibly be true. Their tone seems to be of a self-serving attitude of young men. They are, for the most part, telling the king what to do. The finger and thigh comment essentially saying that my weakest point is far stronger than my father's strongest point. This is an obvious exaggeration. Verse 11 says, I, I will add to your yoke. I will discipline you with scorpions. The message is more than, than excuse me. The message is that, is that more from you will be required, not less. Because, of my, because my aspirations are greater than my father. We see immaturity here. And there's no, dis, there's no discussion about the plan, only the burden. <clears throat> This is this is a response to what is perceived to be a, to be an insult. Being in Shechem in the first place instead of Jerusalem and being asked such a thing by the slaves, this sounds more like Pharaoh's directive in Egypt: make bricks without straw. Exodus five seven. Than any responsible uh, than any responsible leader, they only they were treated cruelly in Egypt, and this sounds no better than God's holy land. Rehoboam doesn't consider how this message is going to be received. The words. I will are used four times in four verses, clearly as an emphasis about himself. Uh, 
uh, verse 14. The king answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him. And he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men. The elders advised him to speak good words, but he speaks harshly of the harsh uh, harshly of the harsh conditions he has planned for them without anticipating how the words will be received. In this, the people hear a man who exalts himself above all others at their expense. Rehoboam's plan is to use the people to build his authority rather than rather than using his authority to build the people. Verse 15, so the king did not listen to the people for it was excuse me, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which which the Lord spoke by Ahijah, the Shalonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Two things. First, notice that this turn of affairs brought brought about by the Lord. Re, um, Rehoboam is up against the plan of God, and there's no chance uh, because the Lord has changed his fortune. This is further emphasized in verse 24. Uh, which is the key to understanding all of this, where the Lord says, quote, this thing is from me, end quote. It should be said that it doesn't mean it was God's will for Rehoboam to speak harshly to his brothers. I don't think that's ever God's plan for us, but the outcome has already been preordained. God did allow Rehoboam's arrogance to flow freely. Second, oftentimes in the Bible, uh, when the Bible lists people's names and their fathers, who who were who where they are from, there is there is there is something being communicated by the meaning of the names that fit in the story as we're being told. Ahijah means brothers or brothers of Yahweh or brothers of the Lord. Shalonite means from Shiloh, which is a place of rest. Jeroboam, we already saw, means people contended. Nebat means look for aspect. Maybe there is a message here from the brothers uh, in the Lord that there is a place of rest available. Your life is full of contention, and maybe God wants you wants 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 you to see there is another perspective, His perspective. One thing that is clearly missing from the young men's position, in in, in the in the sense of a sensational awareness, we've already talked about Solomon's success in the building projects that consume the resources from the people heavily. In addition to that, political instability is starting to form and they didn't recognize it. First, Jeroboam fled to Egypt because Solomon recognized him as a threat and wanted to kill him. Rehoboam and the, and, and the advisors didn't recognize, uh, did not recognize that. Second, God raised adversaries against Solomon prior to his death. They don't seem to recognize that the political winds around them are changing. Solomon married a great number of foreign women to guarantee peace. Now, Solomon is dead. They should understand that the entire political landscape around them is now different. What else is missing here? The most important thing is, is missing is prayer with God. Rehoboam consults with advisors, but not with the advisor, God. It, on, on, on one side of the cross, on, excuse me, on this side of the cross, we would say with the counselor or helper in the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring you uh, and bring your remembrance that all that I have said to you. One thing in this section doesn't necessarily teach is that the advice of young men is meaningless or, or always bad. In this case, it certainly was, but it certainly isn't a universal truth. Wisdom or childish, childishness can come from both young and elderly people. Og Mandino, in his book, The Greatest Salesman in the World, uh, has a quote on that, speaking of a young person starting their journey with little experience, he says, I will commence my journey unencumbered with either the weight or unnecessary knowledge or the handicap or meaningless experience. There is something to be said in that. There is, clear leadership, there is a clear leadership lesson here. Leaders should seek guidance uh, when they are unaware of what to do. They should know who to seek it from. They should be aware of the needs of the people. Good leaders know how to listen. Then, then they should think. 
The country isn't being led by a committee of buddies, but by a king. The king takes in guidance, but understands that he has to weigh all the facts and make the best decision when it comes to the contract constraints and favors. Solomon asked God for wisdom. Rehoboam does not. Verse 16, and when all Israel saw the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the sons of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. This is, this is a rhetorical question. What portion? And asking this question, <clears throat> excuse me, and asking this question, they are really saying that we have no portion. The word portion and inheritance speak to the belonging. And they are saying that we no longer belong to you. The phrase Israel went to their tents is a way of saying they left and went home, not necessarily to literal tents, but that they would look after their own interest and welfare and would, would, and would form their own nation. The reference to David is, is the former kingdom. This is the point in which the nation of Israel splits into two separate kingdoms. The northern kingdom known as Israel and the southern kingdom will be known as Judah. The words Jeroboam uh, are the same spoken by Sheba 50 or 60 years earlier to David. Second Samuel chapter 10 verse 1 says, Now, now there happened to be a worthless man whose, whose name was Sheba, son of Bitri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and, and he said, we have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the sons of Jesse and the son of Jesse, every man to his tent, O Israel. The thought, the thought was that David was giving special treatment to Judah because he was from Judah. The sentiment has been brewing for a long time. Continue on in verse 17, it says, Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Rehoboam returned to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and takes up his kingship over a, a vastly reduced country. This confirms what God previously said, that he would give Solomon's son one tribe to rule over uh, for the sake of David in 1 Kings 11, uh, verse 13, and in verse 36. In verse 18, we'll see the, the people's response to uh, Rehoboam, and it says this in verse 18, it says, King Rehoboam said, Adoran, Adoran, who was the taskmaster over forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. The people who were forced labor during the time of Solomon were having none of it anymore. Rehoboam may have meant to may have meant to meant the visit as intimidation, and all the people likely viewed it as a threat. There's no mention of any military presence to protect uh, Adoron uh, and Rehoboam. Uh, Jeroboam was very like was likely very familiar with Adoran. Ad Adoram, sorry, because Jeroboam was previously in charge of the forced labor from Ephraim and Manasseh and probably reported to Adoram, uh, his reaction confirmed their, uh, the reaction confirmed their refusal to be part of the nation any longer. Verse 18, King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot and flee Jerusalem. Rehoboam's show of intimidation by bringing the forced labor taskmaster uh, in his turn intimida was intimidated by the resistance of the people, he flees to escape any injury to himself. Verse 19, it says this, Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Uh, to this day just simply means uh, at the moment of the writing of the books of First Kings and First and Second Kings. This phrase is used a handful of times in the, in the two books, uh, which, which were written at least 350 years later. Jeroboam becomes king in the new nation made up of the northern 10 tribes uh, and, and calls the new nation Israel. Later in the Bible, it is often referred to as, as Ephraim because the tribes of Ephraim became dominant, just like the uh, tribe of Judah uh, before it. It has been said that he who rules over over others must first learn to rule himself. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, according to 1 Kings 14, 21. He wasn't a teenager or anything like that. Like his father, he had no experience in life to prepare him to be king. Unlike his father, he doesn't consult with the heavenly father. 
For here, through the remainder of first and second kings, the nation is divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Jeroboam would go on to solidify the separation of the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom by establishing places of worship in Bethel and Dan, complete with golden calves, as in the book of Exodus. He told the people of the north that it is too difficult for you to go to Jerusalem to worship. Here are your gods you can worship here. Chapter 12, verses 28 through 30. He appointed his own priest and instituted his own festival on that, on, on excuse me, on a day of his own choosing that would compete against the festival of tabernacles held in, in Jerusalem. We've just witnessed the rupture of the kingdom and its trouble from here to the end. Despite that, we'll see a lot of wonderful godly people along the way living in spiritual dark spiritually dark times does it sound like um it relates to our world today second the fate of the nation largely resists on leadership one of the chief purposes of god was to make excuse me one of the chief purposes of god was to make israel a great nation that's the promise made to abram This promise was to be essential to carrying out God's purpose and giving a revelation and establishing his kingdom in the world. Here we see the very chosen instrument uh, essential to carrying out God's purpose to bless and save the world, the Israelite nation. Um, at, it, it's threatened with destruction, and that destruction comes from, from within, but it is by the hand and by the plan of God. The direction of your country is in the hands of your leaders to a large degree, to a large degree. To be certain, we are personally accountable for our own spiritual salvation and eternal destiny, but the leadership of the country uh, can have a large impact on the culture that surrounds us. We see that in today in our own country, don't we? The character of the leadership of the country and the culture it promotes in the country is the thing God often uses to determine the blessings and the protection of the country. There are times when the country, your country, will benefit uh, in that perspective, or like it or not, uh, whether you think it is fair or not, there are times when your country will suffer because of the leadership uh, it has been given. Third, what do you think this event did to the psyche, the mindset of the average person, either in the northern or the southern kingdom? What did it do to their sense of security, their, their economic security, their political security, or even their, their, their border security with their military? What did it do with their sense of, of being God's chosen people? No matter where you live, no matter what you did, life just changed in an incredible way, and it would never be the same. God, of course, is always in control, and his plan never fails. But the change in conditions here would affect uh, every, every thought and emotion that you, you would have going forward. What do you think that says about the people who are divisive? Fourth, it's been said that bad advice is free and worth every penny. We live in a time where you can now get bad advice from a stranger a thousand miles away. and You don't even know if you will ever meet uh, through the amazing gift of social media. Yeah, what a gift. That being the case, how do you know good advice when you hear it? Generally speaking, good advice is more likely to come from people with age and experience, but that's no guarantee. Are you able to recognize good advice? Are you able to recognize bad advice? Is that advice godly? Does it reflect the holiness of our Heavenly Father? Does it, do we see the attributes of the advice that we receive? through an eternal lens and is it something you know the whole what would jesus do wwjd is always a great way to, to measure advice finally almost a thousand years after the events of chapter 12 another king would come along and would be compared with king david solomon and all of the others he can be counted on for the best advice in fact he prepared the way for the helper the holy spirit to be with each of us as we've already discussed. He knew how lost uh, we were, excuse me, he knew how, how life were lost. So he said, 
do not lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Excuse me, treasure on earth. Wow, that was really wrong. Let me start all over. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He also said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. He would go on to say, I am among you as one who serves you in Luke chapter 22, verse 7. It is always, if you want to know more about who Jesus Christ is, how to become a Christian, we invite you to, to visit www.houstonsfirst.org forward slash the hyphen loop forward slash about forward slash discover hyphen Christ. We pray that this uh, lesson blesses you and helps to prepare you to, uh, to teach God's word more effectively. And uh, God bless you and have a great night. Thank you so much.